Southeast governors warn Enamdi Kanu over his threats to attack them. Kanu fumes. Gunmen attack convoy of Nasarawa deputy governor. Three policemen, one civilian killed. On the foreign scene, Brexit fears cast shadow over businesses in Cyprus. And in sport, Flying Eagles defeat South Africa to top group A in ongoing African games. This is ANN News. I am Ola Jumoke, Ola Tunji. Southeast governors have drawn a battle line between them and leader of the proscribed indigenous people of Biafra, Ipope, over threats to attack them. The governors have issued a strong warning to Namdi Kanu in a statement that also threatened Kanu of repatriation if he makes good on his threat. He said Kanu would be brought back to Nigeria to face the wrath of the people. Over the weekend, Senator Ike Kuramadu was attacked and assaulted in Nuremberg, Germany, where he was attending the annual New Yam Festival and Convention of Indibu in the country. IPOP claimed responsibility a few minutes later in a press statement released by its spokesperson, Ima Powerful. Kanu confirmed the statement in a broadcast on the group's radio. He maintained that his Southeast governors and other Igbo politicians must get the same fate with Equitamadu whenever they were seen in public overseas. IPOP's attack on Equitamadu has been widely condemned. Southeast governors have described the attack as a display of shame and ignorance. They noted Kanos threatened them and said he is fighting for his own self-interest, but pretending to be fighting for Indibu. They said he would soon be exposed if it does not reverse his action. The Southeast governor said they would continue to protect the citizens in their regions against killer herdsmen and other insecurity and would not be distracted by cheap talks. Meanwhile, on his Twitter page, the IPOP leader described as a shame to the Igbo a letter the governors had sent to President Muhammadu Buhari on some issues, including herdsmen. Kano says cattle is livestock and that the zoo constitution allows the state and local government authorities, not the presidents, to regulate it. Nasarawa State Deputy Governor Dr. Emmanuel Akabe set out over the weekend for what he thought would be a routine ride from Lafia to Abuja, but gunmen interrupted his convoy a few kilometers from Akwanga. They killed three policemen and a civilian. One of those in the convoy described the gunmen as armed robbers and said they opened fire on the convoy and then fled. He said the fourth casualty of the attack was a civilian driver. The corpses were taken to the Dahatu Arab Specialist Hospital in Lafia. The deputy governor was unhurt, but he looked shaky at the hospital. He made no comments on the incident to journalists. Kano State Governor Abdullahi Ganduje says the state government plans to convert five forests to grazing reserves for herdsmen in the state. While speaking to journalists in Abuja on Tuesday, the governor said a technical committee has been inaugurated on farm settlements for herdsmen in the state. Ganduje says the pro proposed settlement would discourage herders' movement from north to south and would assist in boosting socioeconomic ventures in the state. The governor said herders' settlements should not be a national or state issue. The herders' lives are live and flourish in every state. He said his administration will work harder to ensure farmers enjoy more assistance programs and projects to boost agriculture in their state. Two cults have invaded and spread panic in Njabo de Inogun state. The tension in the city is caused by members of Aye and Aye confraternities who were set to take turns in retaliating the alleged killing of their member. City residents were reportedly jolted and running for cover as the cultists continued to terrorize the city. The problem is said to have brewed at Tuesday's uh, Ojudioba festival in the city where superiority battle had erupted between the two groups. A member of a Ye confraternity was said to have been killed in the evening of the festival by a member of a Ye confraternity, allegedly with a poisonous dagger, by his friend who had had a lingering grudge. 
Members of the Aye Confraternity were said to have retaliated their members' death by killing two Aye members before daybreak. Ken weaving is a subsector of the building and construction industry in this country. But given the high demand for imported upholstery, the art is fast becoming extinct. Reporter Deji Badmos met two men in Abuja, the nation's capital, who are holding on to the tradition regardless of overwhelming competition. Talk about artistry with precision and tact at play. These hands have undergone many years of training to be able to weave these different patterns and designs, which ordinarily appear very complex. Ken weaving is a very popular Nigerian art, which can be traced way back to pre-colonial times. And Donald's story attests to this fact. The art is deeply rooted in his genealogy. He has a background in farming and fishing. And what he now does with the cane is something he inherited from his father. My own father's origin now starts from the cane. We transport it outside Nigeria. So we use it to make, we use it to make a living, to support the farming. So as long as in our say we should migrate to the cane, we should leave the bankere, we will come to the foreign one like the cane. So we enter the cane. And I started using it for bed, shears, baskets, for December hamper, salad. The durability of their products stand them out. And that stems from the fact that every of the material they use is locally sourced. We don't import a single material. Everything we use, we get from here. We source them from our forest here and transform them into the beautiful pieces you see around you. My customers, there are many. Like when you build us, like a estate, we be the one planting the flowers, put the, the, your shears, your bush shears, your, your post side, put in those shears. We can put rubber, we can put cane, we can put rope to design those uh, facilities. Bars, restaurants and hotels are their biggest customers. This restaurant is designed with furniture purchased from Donald and his colleague. The restaurant manager says apart from creating the African ambience in a local food store, the furniture is also sending a signal for why Made in Nigeria products should be patronized. Everybody is used to the usual plastic chairs and tables at other local restaurants. And we only felt it's right to give, you know, something different, something African, something cultural. And if you go abroad, you can never find a place like this. You don't ever go to a restaurant abroad and you see tables or the furniture. Let me just say the furniture made out of African sources. Donald and Abednego are looking to grow in their business out of this roadside park. But they say that might be difficult to happen because they don't enjoy good patronage, saying most Nigerians still choose imported furniture over locally made ones. If you go to the village, even the royal chief, most of them don't use this one in their palace. They prefer the, 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 the king palace. You put a full street. I want government to put more attention to what we are doing. To create a platform, a place where we, just, not just only me, me and my, my colleagues, my, the ones that they are doing this job, to have a place we can settle where we can do this job and we can make more income to the economy. With little or no formal education, this men have gone ahead to provide sources of income for themselves. Their intention is to train as many people as possible and also pass the trade down to their children as well. Coming up, African news. Revelations of campaign finance misdeeds pose embarrassment to South African presidents. And later, international news. Even Cyprus businesses are feeling what Brexit may do to them. You are watching ANN. Dear Mommy, you went out that night with the baby in your tummy, but you did not come back. The baby is very fine and she eats and sleeps a lot. Everyone says that you are in a better place, but I miss you so much. I keep asking them, where is the better place? 
nobody as as me. Auntie Kemi just hugs me and says go and play. Mommy, I miss you. Please, when are you coming home? I still do miss you, Mom. And in honor of your memory, I'm a doctor today working with the MTN Foundation to save mothers and children every day. Ending mother and child mortality in Nigeria is dear to us. We will keep strengthening this most important bond just for you. Welcome back. This is the News Now to African Stories. South Africa's President Cyril Ramaphosa is facing the most embarrassing period of his administration. Licked bank statements revealed names of donors as well as people who allegedly received money from Ramaphosa's CR17 fundraising campaign set up to help him become African National Congress leader two years ago. Two opposition MPs from the Economic Freedom Fighters, whose names appeared in the bank statements widely shared on social media, resigned after admitting to receiving funds from the CR17 campaign. Tabogo Mokwela stated in her resignation letter that she received two payments of 40,000 rand, that is $2,600 each for personal use. Another MP, Kasigag Mogosi, said she had collected the same amount. A decision, Mogosi says, was related to personal situations she had. President Ramaphosa's office has responded for the first time since the leaks at the weekend. His spokesperson, Kusela Diko, says it simply shows that the president is a caring and compassionate human being. The president who campaigned on a ticket of clean government is expected to face opposition MPs in parliament this week in a question and answer session. Those MPs are already rubbing their hands together in anticipation. Sudan has completed the formation of an 11-member sovereign council on Tuesday to run the country for a three-year transitional period until elections. The sovereign council will be led by Lieutenant General Abdel Fattah al-Burhan, head of the Transitional Military Council that has ruled the Sudan since April, when veteran leader Omar Hazan al-Bashir was deposed. Members of the sovereign council and the prime minister have been sworn in today. Last week, the country's main opposition alliance nominated economist Abdullah Handok to serve as prime minister in the country's transitional government. A partial agreement signed on Saturday paves the way for a transitional government in eventual elections. It provides for a sovereign council as the highest authority in the country, but largely delegates executive powers to the cabinet of ministers. The main challenge for the new government will be an economic crisis stemming from a shortage of foreign currency, resulting in a cash crunch and long lines for fuel and bread. For many years, Libyans have been struggling with a severely underdeveloped health care system. As a result, they have been seeking medical treatment in other countries, such as Tunisia. The interim government in Libya has been sending those wounded during the country's revolution abroad for treatment, but some Libyans say they have not been able to get the financial assistance they need from their country. Abnin Tawuchi reports. These two young men were seeking financial assistance from the Libyan embassy in Tunis. The Libyan nationals claim they took arms in Tripoli to defend their city against the recent military assault. <laughs> I was wounded in the fighting and almost lost my life. It's shameful that Libyans do not have money to go to clinics in Tunisia. We were welcomed by the Tunisian medical staff but got rejected by our own embassy and health authorities. We defended our city and honor. We deserve a better treatment. The Libyan men described horrific scenes. They said that thousands of fighters and civilians were unable to travel to neighboring Tunisia and other countries. Libya is unsafe and insecure. The number of victims and the wounded is on the rise. Analysts assert that thousands of Libyans from the internationally recognized government in Tripoli as well as Khalifa Haftar forces are now treated in the same clinics and sometimes in the same section or room in Tunisia. Tunisia does not intervene in the Libyan conflict. Tunisian doctors provide medical assistance to all Libyans without distinction. Many Libyans use their own savings or rely on their families and tribes to pay for treatment. Official statistics reveal that over 800,000 Libyans have traveled to Tunisia for medical treatment since the 2011 unrest.
According to the Ministry of Health, hundreds of Libyans are now looking for medical treatment at public hospitals in the cities of Sfax, Sous and Tunis, as well as the border region of Midnin. This phenomenon has increased following the escalation of the armed conflict in Libya. In preparations for Thursday's vote to elect a president, the semi autonomous southern Somali state of Jubaland has blocked access to the capital city Kismayo and its main airport. The move underscores escalating tensions between Jubaland authorities and the federal government in Mogadishu, who have been seeking to exert control over the election process in the last month. On Saturday, the Somali government said it would not recognize the result of the election in Jubaland, a key battleground state for counterterrorism operations. It says the candidate selection process violated the national constitution. The standoff could spark a dangerous wider conflict. Incumbent Jubaland President Ahmed Mohamed Madobe, who is seeking re-election this week, is a key security partner for Kenya, while Ethiopia has grown closer to the federal government in Mogadishu in the last year. Both Ethiopia and Kenya have significant numbers of peacekeepers in Somalia. Security analysts say a split between them would undermine international counter-terrorism operations against Al-Qaeda-linked Islamic al-Shabaab. When we return international news, Brexit fears cast a shadow over businesses in Cyprus. And later, sport. Flying Eagles defeat South Africa to top Group A. watching ANN. Welcome back. This is ANN News. Now to international stories. Italy's Prime Minister Giuseppe Conte has resigned, effectively averting a no-confidence vote tabled by the far-right League Party's leader, Matteo Salvini. In an hour-long speech at the Italian Senate on Tuesday afternoon, Conte launched a catching attack on Deputy Prime Minister Salvini, who earlier this month had pushed for new elections. Conte said the government's coalition between the hardline anti-immigrant league party and the anti-establishment five-star movement no longer holds a majority in parliament. Conte said Salvini's demand for fresh elections just 18 months after he assumed power was irresponsible. He assumed, or rather, he accused Salvini of putting the national interest at risk in order to advance his own personal interest. Conte listened to the rest of Tuesday's Senate debate before submitting his resignation letter to President Sergio Mattarella. Conte, a law professor with no previous political experience, became Prime Minister in June last year. The toll from a suicide bomb attack on a Kabul wedding party last weekend has risen to 80. The initial death toll was 63.0. Ministry says 17 others have died from injuries since then. The Islamic State militant group claimed responsibility for the attack, the 17th to take place in Kabul since the beginning of the year, and the second deadliest in August alone. The attack came as Washington and the Taliban reportedly moved closer to a deal to end the nearly 18-year war. The U.S. State Department has approved the sale of 66 F-16 fighters to Taiwan. The State Department announced on Tuesday, Taiwan will get the latest version of the Lockheed Martin built fighter in the $8 billion deal. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo said in the statement, President Trump had given the green light on the proposed sale after Congress was notified last week. The sale also includes 75 General Electric engines as well as other systems. U.S. Senate Foreign Relations Committee Chairman Jim Rich says this fight is critical to improving Taiwan's ability to defend its sovereign airspace, which he says is under increasing pressure from China. Taiwan's plan to upgrade its air defenses comes amid increasing Chinese military incursions into its airspace. Beijing regards Taiwan as a part of China awaiting reunification, but the island is self-ruled and is a close ally of the U.S. U.S. Commerce Secretary Wilbur Bross announced the U.S. is giving Huawei another 90 days before properly blacklisting it from doing business with American firms. 
The Department of Commerce placed Huawei on an entity list back in May, which bars American firms from doing business with the company without obtaining permission from the government. The U.S. granted Huawei a 90-day license to help its customers transition. That license was due to run out today. Nathan King reports. After delaying some tariffs on telecoms and computer equipment last week, this week the Trump administration is granting another temporary reprieve for Huawei. This will mean Huawei will continue to be able to use Google's Android operating system on its smartphones, chips from U.S. companies like Qualcomm, and continue to supply rural networks in the U.S. that depend heavily on the company. Huawei was placed on the so-called entities list for ill-defined national security reasons back in May. But pressure from U.S. tech giants like Google and semiconductor firms that depend on Huawei for a big chunk of their profits had pressured the White House to ease the ban. While the move will help Huawei in the short term, the U.S. Commerce Secretary also announced the U.S. has added another 46 Huawei affiliates to the entities list and that this extension was only granted to give U.S. companies and customers time to switch suppliers. In response, Huawei said this extension does not change the fact that the company has been treated unjustly. The statement reads in part, we oppose the U.S. Commerce Department's decision to add another 46 Huawei affiliates to the entity list. It's clear that this decision made at this particular time is politically motivated and has nothing to do with national security. These actions violate the basic principles of free market competition. They are in no one's interest, including U.S. companies. Of course, placing Huawei on this entities list, along with dozens of its affiliates, is part of the global war on the telecommunications company unleashed by the Trump administration. As we know, there has been pressure put on allies in Asia and Europe to abandon Huawei when it comes to the rollout of 5G uh, technology, of which it is a leader. So far, that has had a lukewarm response in Europe and in Asia. In fact, Huawei continues uh, to increase its revenues in these areas despite U.S. pressure. But only a few weeks away from the deadline to finalise negotiations between the EU and the UK, the uncertainty of what Brexit deal will evolve or if one will be agreed at all remains as strong as ever. Given the latest developments, the need for action from those businesses that have not made up their contingency plans is critical, especially if they need to retain access to their EU client's base. As the political, legal and indeed business implications of Brexit continue to be debated, the uncertainty continues as the final outcome of the deal cannot be predicted especially for financial businesses in Cyprus. Cyprus is synonymous with a laid-back lifestyle. Sun, beach, sand, vacation. But a few years ago, things weren't so relaxed. Financial crisis fueled by bank lending necessitated a bailout and tough austerity measures. Ironically, at the same time, Forex companies doing business in Cyprus were thriving. Why would global investment firms set up shop in a country downgraded to junk status? Because we have also uh, the FCA regulation that is based in UK, this gives uh, strength and even more uh, the trust for clients, uh, investors. Regulations protecting investors and significant tax breaks. 12.5% corporate tax versus the UK's 19% make Cyprus an attractive incorporation address. There are about 100 international Forex companies operating out of Cyprus today, but the boom is starting to bust. New EU regulations aimed at standardizing investments are pushing companies toward less regulated countries. The big ones are staying, but they're only making maybe a third of the money they were making before. And there is Brexit to consider. We have uh, two licenses and two legal entities in the UK and here in Cyprus. We're well prepared for um, any case of uh, any scenario of Brexit. Standard & Poor ranks Cyprus as one of the top four economies vulnerable to Brexit trade effects. Still ahead, sports. Flying Eagles defeat South Africa to top Group A in African Games. Please join us again. You are watching ANN. Welcome back. This is Ada News in Sport. 
Niger's Flying Eagles secured their first three points on Tuesday by defeating South Africa 2-1 at the ongoing 12th African Games. The Flying Eagles topped the group with four points and will now play host Morocco in their last group game on Friday in Rabat. FIFA has installed a new committee to run the game of football in Egypt after the sudden resignation of the previous board. President Nani Abu Rida and other members of the Egypt Football Association quit en masse at the host country for the just concluded African Cup of Nations failed to win the last championship. New members still have to go through a FIFA background check but will start work immediately. The new board is needed to carry out EFA's day-to-day -day business. It will also ensure elections are held by the end of July next year. That is any news this evening. Thank you for joining us. For details on these and other breaking stories, visit our website, annafrica.news. Conversation continues on our social media platforms, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at ANN Africa TV. I am Olajimokyo Latunji. Have a pleasant evening.